Welcome to Masters and Creators, the show where we look through the ages at creative icons whose influence affects the way we tell stories today. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at the creator of Cthulhu, the father of all modern horror, the eldritch H.P. Lovecraft. When you think of modern horror, the name H.P. Lovecraft might not pop into your head, because unfortunately most people don't know who he is, what he created, or why he's so influential. Yet nearly every creator in every genre in every medium says that H.P. Lovecraft has influenced them in some way, and this includes Stephen King, J.K. Rowling, and Ridley Scott. Lovecraft pushed the boundaries of art and redefined what horror could be, and we have yet to have another writer as influential as him. But with all of this being said, why isn't he a household name? Lovecraft was born in Providence, Rhode Island in 1890. We don't know much about his early years, but what we do know is when he was three years old, his father was on a business trip in Chicago and had a psychotic episode and was committed to Butler Hospital. We don't know anything about Lovecraft's relationship with his father. The only thing we do know is that about a year before this, Lovecraft's father started to act very strange. After his father's commitment, his mother and himself would move to the family home in Providence. His mother was part of the Phillips family and they were incredibly well off. They were amongst some of the aristocracy of the East Coast during that time. His grandfather was actually Whipple Van Buren Phillips. In 1989, while still in the hospital, his father would die of syphilis. His mother didn't have syphilis, so this meant his father had been cheating on his mother. This caused Lovecraft's mother to become incredibly overbearing and incredibly distant towards Lovecraft at the same time. She always had to have Lovecraft in her sight, but when she did, she described him as disgusting and outright insulted him to neighbors. And this caused Lovecraft to become a recluse for much of his childhood. But his childhood wasn't all bad. You see, his grandfather really took charge of Lovecraft's education, and he loved the horror stories that his grandfather would tell him. And in their attic was this immense library. Lovecraft would often sneak up there with just a candle and read every story you could imagine, and he became obsessed with two things, the 18th century and England. He was a complete Anglophile. In fact, through his entire life, he would act like how he believed an English gentleman from the 18th century would act like. By the time he was eight years old, he discovered science, he started with chemistry, and quickly discovered astronomy, and preferred that a lot. He would go on record saying, it was through astronomy that I gained a sense of boundlessness of the universe, and the insignificance of humanity in the cosmos. However, rather than praising her son's interests in science, Lovecraft's mother was just like, why is my son not going out to play with other kids? Like, this makes no sense. She really didn't understand her child or make much of an attempt to understand her child. As a teenager, he began to write his own stories, and unfortunately, we have very few of his stories from this time period. But what we do know is that he really tried to imitate Edgar Allan Poe. The earliest published story of Lovecraft's was actually written in 1908 when Lovecraft Lovecraft was 17 or 18 years old. The story is called The Alchemist, and it's about how a dark wizard has cursed a family to all die at 32 years old, meaning one of them will be born, they'll age to 32, and then they will die. Turns out he's created an elixir of life, so he is immortal, so he can personally do these murders to make sure the family always dies at 32 years old. The story would actually be published in 1916 in the pages of United Amateur Magazine. But way before this, in 1904, Whipple Phillips unfortunately died. And with him went the family's estate and by extension, the library that Lovecraft grew up in. Because of this, Lovecraft had to start attending school to get an education. And he didn't really flourish in this environment like he had in the library because he discovered that to do astronomy, you had to be good at maths, and he wasn't good at maths. So this sort of crushed his only interest and career path because he didn't believe you should make money off of writing. He believed an English gentleman would just write for the love of writing, so you couldn't make money off of writing. There was no way that that was a thing that people could do. So by going to school, he kind of had his dreams crushed, and then in 1908, he just left school one day and didn't go back. He would become a recluse, just reading books and sort of being on his own, until 1917. It was actually during this time that he found amateur pulp magazines, and pulp magazines are where the majority of his work was actually published. The reason amateur publishing in particular was so important to him was because it was just a group of people writing for the sake of writing. People just 
did it for the love of the art. And like I said before, he believed a person shouldn't be paid for their creative endeavors, so this was obviously very appealing to him. And even though he didn't believe that you should go the traditional publishing route where you make money, he did want people to read his stuff, so obviously getting his work out there in any way was great. It's fair to say that if he never found the world of amateur publishing, we probably would never have heard of H.P. Lovecraft. His love for amateur writing was so strong that it would actually go on to create his own amateur magazine titled The Conservative, and this was also actually his journal. That's right, before people had blogs, people would publish their own journals. You can't talk about The Conservative without talking about Lovecraft's worldviews, which became very apparent in the pages of The Conservative. Lovecraft was very racist and xenophobic. He believed if you weren't descended from England, you were a second-class human, basically. But when it comes to Lovecraft, I would actually like to quote Emma Rose from the blog Why Words Work. He was a racist. It was considered normal then, but now we know better. Even though he's very much a product of his time, there is no excuse for his attitude and behavior. Yet with that said, to understand him and therefore elements of his art, we need to keep his beliefs in mind, however wrong they may be. The truth is, his racism and horrible worldviews were very much a part of his work, but it'll be wrong to discuss him without bringing this up, because he should be held accountable for his views. Even if it is 80 years after his death, we do need to hold him responsible for the message he put out there. It's that simple. Regardless of his views, his self-published journal gathered a large audience, some that agreed with his views and some that didn't, and they all responded to him through letters. And this is how he made a lot of friends, and some of these people will be his friends until his death. In 1919, an amateur magazine called The Vagrant would take notice of Lovecraft's work, and his first commercially published piece would be called Dagon. This story is about a man that becomes lost at sea after being chased by German sea raiders in World War I. He would find an island in on this island he would find an ancient race of fish people and would run for his life. While this doesn't sound scary in itself, the story is almost entirely atmosphere and tone and to read it, it is incredibly scary. But the hook of this story, the thing that no one had really done before, was that the narrator was actually a morphine addict, meaning it was an unreliable narrator. And the idea of an unreliable narrator is so commonplace these days that it's kind of a parody of itself. But before Lovecraft, no one did the unreliable narrator trope. Like, he was kind of the first to do it, and it's insane to think about. You can't talk about Lovecraft's work without talking about the Lovecraftian model. Oftentimes you'll hear people describe something as Lovecraftian. Really what they're saying is this shows an aspect of the Lovecraftian model. First of all, you have a scholarly person or a journalist or someone to that effect doing research on something that is slowly driving them insane. This causes them to become an unreliable narrator. You also have a violation of natural law or what humanity perceives to be a violation of natural law. Because Lovecraft was so into astronomy, he accepted the idea that the universe was infinite. So he liked the idea that there could be things out there that if humans were to just look upon, would drive us insane. Then finally, you have a creature or a being who is so powerful or so grand in scale is just not interested in humanity. Like, it's not against us, it's not for us, it's just not interested in us. Like, you don't feel bad if you accidentally step on one or two ants. And that's the idea that Lovecraft went with. What if we were ants to some creatures in the cosmos? However, it wouldn't be until he came across the work of Dunsany that Lovecraft would get the idea to create his own pantheon of gods. This idea of creating his own gods started very small. He'd start referencing something called the Great Old Ones in a few of his stories. This would advance into something called the Cthulhu Mythos over the years, but we're going to get into that a bit more later. Between 1918 and 1921, he would work a lot as a ghostwriter. This was something that he didn't want to do at first because, like I said, he believed that you shouldn't make money off of your work. By 1921, over 17 of his stories were published as a ghostwriter. But that year, his mother actually died in the same hospital that his father had been committed to earlier on in his life. So he took a break from ghostwriting for a while. But following his mother's death, the unexpected happened. He began to travel, and then he met a Jewish woman and fell in love with her, which was incredibly surprising considering he was a xenophobic person. Apparently early on in their relationship, as a way of showing affection to each other, if the two of them were out on a walk and they had an idea for a story, 
they would hand over their ideas to the other person. Sonia knew how talented her husband was and she wanted him to flourish, so she moved him to New York with her and the two of them lived in Brooklyn for quite some time. And it's here in New York that Lovecraft would finally be published in the pages of Weird Tales magazine. Weird Tales is sort of like this weird roll call of influential writers of the past. You have people like Ray Bradbury who were published in Weird Tales. Lovecraft was published a lot in this magazine, his stories including The Dunwich Horror, The Outsider, and Through the Gates of the Silver Key were all published in Weird Tales. And it's also during this time that Lovecraft created a very important piece of work, the Necronomicon. So the Necronomicon is a reoccurring plot device in a lot of his stories. In his fictional universe, it was a book created by an Arabic man called al Hazaret. This man stumbled across the knowledge of the great old ones and began to worship him. The more he worshipped them, the more he was driven insane. All who read the book are also driven insane. But the book contains a number of summoning rituals for the old ones. If you ever wanted to end the world and just bring back the old gods, you do it through this book if you're not driven insane first. He actually wrote a history of the Necronomicon in the 1920s and it wouldn't be published till after his death in the 1930s, but this history of the Necronomicon was written so well and tied into real world history so well that people to this day think it's a real book somewhere. The Necronomicon is important because while in its loosest form, it is just a plot device that is like, here are where all the forbidden things are. It is also an anchor that ties together Lovecraft's entire fictional universe. Fictional universes weren't really a thing back then. Lovecraft was sort of like poking around in the dark trying to create this thing. I don't think he ever sat down intending to create a fictional universe. It just sort of happened and he did it really well. And we sort of base our foundation of fictional universes off of Lovecraft's model to this day. Look at the Marvel Cinematic Universe, that follows Lovecraft's model of a fictional universe, it's insane. However, his wife's business folded, so she had to move away for work. Lovecraft was only making $15 a month of her writing during this time period, which is worth about $200 today. And that's not enough to live off of, so his wife had to send him an allowance. But obviously, being this 18th century English gentleman living in 20th century America, this really damaged his ego. Also, while living in New York was good for him for a time period, eventually where he was doing so badly financially, and he saw all of these immigrants doing better than him, and he was such a xenophobic person, he began to just be pent up with all of this anger and frustration and became a recluse once again. His friends were worried that he was going to commit suicide, so his aunts intervened and moved him back to Providence. When he got back to Providence, he would use all of that anger, fear, and frustration that he built up while in New York, and he would create The Call of Cthulhu. The story was published in 1928. It is narrated by Francis Wayland Thurston as he recounts notes left by his grand uncle. Basically, his uncle goes down a rabbit hole and ends up becoming a target of Cthulhu worshippers, which ultimately ends in his death. The story is incredibly clumsy by modern standards, like there's no way it will be published in this day and age, but it was filled with so many things that both horror and sci-fi had never seen before. It was incredibly innovative for its time. Fun fact, this story was almost rejected by Weird Tales. It was only thanks to Lovecraft's friend being at the Weird Tales office at that time, and he was like, well, I guess Lovecraft will go and submit it somewhere else. And then the editor of Weird Tales was like, no, put it in this month's issue, put it in this month's issue. The only money Lovecraft ever saw for this story was $175. Think about that. You can go out and buy Cthulhu merchandise right now. Cthulhu is everywhere, especially around Halloween. Cthulhu is just everywhere. There's Cthulhu music albums. And yet, Lovecraft only ever saw $175. Further side note, there's no right or wrong way to say Cthulhu because it's not a word made to be said by humans. Lovecraft explicitly stated the language that the great old ones speak is totally different to humans because they're physically different. And that's why humans physically can't say Cthulhu. In 1927, he would start the book, The Case of Charles Dexter Ward. And this was his only novel. It's all about how Charles Dexter Ward was obsessed with his ancestor. His ancestor was a practitioner of alchemy and quabolic feats. He follows in his ancestors' footsteps 
and resurrect him. This wouldn't actually be published till 1941, after Lovecraft's death, because he thought this story was terrible, but a lot of scholars and critics say that this is Lovecraft's best piece of work. The crazy thing is, it only ever went through one draft because Lovecraft wrote it, thought it wasn't good, and then shoved it in a drawer. People discovered it after he died. Following this, he would create a short story which would be published. It was called The Color Out of Space, was written in 1927, and is my favorite story from Lovecraft. It's about a color that exists outside of the known spectrum that falls to earth on a meteor and basically pollutes the surrounding area and warps the minds of people that live near it. The reason I like this story so much is that it deals with cosmic horror and physical horror. There are aspects of this story that exist outside of what humanity can comprehend, but at the same time there are aspects that are very much real. It transcends what we can interact with while being very grounded in reality. And I really like that, and I haven't read anything else quite like it. He never got paid for this story though, as it was published outside of Weird Tales, and it's this lack of payment that convinced him to only stay with Weird Tales for the rest of his life. In terms of his personal life, in 1929 his wife would request a divorce, as they'd only seen each other a handful of times since 1926. He would agree to this divorce, but would never file the paperwork, meaning they were both technically married until his death in 1937. It is worth saying though that his wife would remarry, she would have a child, and she would live a full life. In the early 1930s there was the discovery of Pluto, so Lovecraft would write The Whisper in Darkness. This is very much the beginning of the end of Lovecraft's career, but it's got some of his most well-written work in it. He would really begin to flesh out his monsters and how they interact with the characters, they weren't just products of fear anymore. You've got these monsters literally convincing humans to become brains in cans that go across the universe and they're convincing people to willingly do this. It's pretty much agreed on the fact that he became so good at writing because he fell in love with traveling. Like, he went everywhere across the states, he went to Canada, which for a xenophobic man born in New England was a huge deal. And in fact, I believe his worldview did begin to soften around this time and he began to become a lot more accepting. His wallet couldn't keep up with his newfound love of travel though, and he'd try writing to try and make some money to continue traveling. He would even write The Shadow Over Innsmouth to be able to travel. But ultimately he was on the slow wind down and only 10 of his stories would be published from 1931 to 1937 and he would only publish six journals from 1931 to 1937 and one of these journals was his own death journal. In January of 1937 he was diagnosed with cancer in the small intestine. He would die of March that year aged 46. Lovecraft is one of the most notable pulp fiction writers just because of how influential he is. The reason people have never heard of him was because most of his work only existed in pulp fiction magazines and most of his stories were very very short. There are entire books that put all of his work into a single book and it's shorter than some novels these days. With that being said it's amazing to see how a man that wrote such short stories was so influential and tried so many new things that worked. If you would like to get into reading Lovecraft for yourself, I definitely recommend you check out The Call of Cthulhu and the entire Cthulhu mythos, followed by The Color Out of Space. If you want something a little bit more interactive, I definitely recommend you try the Dark Souls inspired game, Bloodborne. It's very, very well done. It captures the Lovecraft tone and the Lovecraft themes perfectly. Like, it's the only video game to do it successfully. It's brilliant. In terms of movies and TV shows, just watch any horror or sci-fi. Chances are it borrows from Lovecraft and Mary Shelley, so any horror sci-fi show will do. But for now, that is it for me. If you want to see more of my face, please come on over to my YouTube channel. It's super effective, where I talk about comics and cosplay and anything I want to. Thank you so much for watching. This has been Masters and Creators from Frames to Names.